Iron Maiden is one of the most influential and successful heavy metal bands in history. Known for their iconic sound, elaborate live performances, iconic album covers, and powerful anthems that have defined the genre for nearly five decades. The band is formed in 1975 by bassist and primary songwriter Steve Harris and has sold over 100 million records worldwide and has received numerous awards and accolades. With 17 studio albums under their belt, each release tells a unique story and showcases the band's evolution. I won't include live albums and compilations on this ranking, so let's get started. Number 17, the 11th studio album, Virtual Eleven, released on the 23rd of March 1998 by EMI Records, produced by Steve Harris and Nigel Green. It is the second and final album to feature Blaze Bailey as the lead vocalist, following The X Factor in 1995. Virtual Eleven presents a mix of the band's classic heavy metal sound with some experimental elements, leading to mixed reactions from fans and critics alike. I think this is the weakest Iron Maiden album, but it has some good songs like Futurial, The Klansman, and Como Este Amigos. Number 16, the 10th studio album, The X Factor, released on October 2nd, 1995 through EMI Records, produced by Steve Harris and Nigel Green. Iron Maiden's The X Factor, released in 1995, is a pivotal album in the band's discography. It marked the debut of vocalist Blaze Bailey, who replaced Bruce Dickinson after his departure in 1993. The album stands out for its darker, more introspective tone, reflecting the band's mood during a challenging period. It showcases their ability to evolve and experiment with their sound, even in the face of significant lineup changes. While it may not have achieved the commercial success of their earlier albums, its depth and complexity make it a fascinating and essential chapter in the Iron Maiden story. My favorite songs from the X Factor album are Sign of the Cross, Lord of the Flies, Man on the Edge, and Judgment of Heaven. Number 15, the 15th studio album, The Final Frontier, released on August 13, 2010 by EMI Records, produced by Steve Harris and Kevin Shirley. The reception was generally positive, with many fans and critics praising the band's willingness to evolve while maintaining their signature sound. Some noted that the album's length and complexity might be challenging for casual listeners. Its blend of progressive elements, thematic depth, and powerful performances make it a standout entry in their discography. As they continue to explore new musical territories, Iron Maiden proves once again why they remain a force to be reckoned with in the world of heavy metal. My favorite songs on this record are El Dorado, Coming Home and When the Wild Wind Blows. Number 14 is the 16th The Book of Souls album released on September 4th, 2015 via Parlophone and BMG Records, produced by Steve Harris and Kevin Shirley. It's a double album and the band's longest to date, clocking in at 92 minutes. The Book of Souls showcased their ability to innovate and push their creative boundaries while staying true to their signature sound. Its epic scope, thematic depth, and masterful performances make it a landmark album in their career. It has some very long songs. My personal favorites are If Eternity Should Fail, Speed of Light, The Great Unknown, the Red and the Black and Tears of a Clown. Number 13 is the 14th A Matter of Life and Death album, released on August 25th, 2006 via EMI Records, produced by Steve Harris and Kevin Shirley. Known for its darker themes and complex compositions, the album reflects Iron Maiden's continued evolution and willingness to tackle profound and challenging subjects. A Matter of Life and Death boasts a raw and organic sound. The production avoids excessive polish, giving the album a live, authentic feel. The intricate guitar work, complex rhythms, and Bruce Dickinson's dynamic vocal performance are all highlighted, showcasing the band's technical prowess and chemistry. Tracks I can mention are Different World, These Colors Don't Run, The Reincarnation of Benjamin Brieg, and For the Greater Good of God. Number 12, the latest 17th studio album Senjutsu, released on September 3rd, 2021 via Parlophone and BMG Records, produced by Steve Harris and Kevin Shirley. It's their second double album after 2015's The Book of Souls. Senjutsu showcases Iron Maiden's ability to balance their classic sound with more progressive and experimental elements, demonstrating their ongoing evolution as a band. It features a rich and polished sound. The production captures the band's live energy and intricate arrangements, with each instrument clearly defined in the mix. The album's progressive elements, including extended instrumental passages and complex song structures, highlight the band's continued evolution and technical prowess. My favorite songs are Stratego, The Writing on the Wall, Lost in a Lost World, The Parchment and Hell on Earth. Number 11 is the eighth studio album, No Prayer for the Dying, released on October 1st, 1990, via EMI Records, 
produced by Martin Birch. This was the first album without guitarist Adrian Smith, replaced by Janet Gers. Reception was mixed. While some fans appreciated the return to a harder edge sound, others felt it lacked the depth and complexity of earlier albums. Critics were generally less enthusiastic about this release compared to the band's previous work. No Prayer for the Dying is often seen as a transitional album in Iron Maiden's career, bridging their 80s heyday with their 90s output. For me, I can say this is not the best release, but it has some great songs as Tail Gunner, Holy Smoke, No Prayer for the Dying, Hooks in You and Bring Your Daughter, To the Slaughter. Number 10. The second Killers album released on February 16, 1981 via EMI Records produced by Martin Birch. It's the last album to feature Paul Diano on vocals and has been replaced by Bruce Dickinson later on. The album showcases a more polished sound compared to their debut, with improved production quality. Reception was generally positive, with many considering it an improvement over their debut, which I don't agree. Killers is seen as an important transitional album, refining the raw energy of their debut while hinting at the more complex compositions to come. The best songs on the album are Wrathchild, Murders, In the Rue Morgue, Killers and Purgatory. Number 913, Dance of Death album released on September 2nd, 2003 via EMI Records, produced by Kevin Shirley. The album continues the progressive direction of its predecessor, with complex compositions and varied song structures. It features a mix of shorter, more direct tracks, which I do admire, and longer, epic pieces. Reception was generally positive, with critics and fans praising the band's continued creativity and strong songwriting. Many viewed it as a worthy follow-up to Brave New World. My favorited songs on this album are Rainmaker, No More Lies, Dance of Death, New Frontier, and Passchendaele. Number 8, Brave New World 12th album released May 29, 2000, via EMI Records produced by Kevin Shirley. It marks a significant moment in Iron Maiden's career. It's the first album to feature the reunited classic lineup, with Bruce Dickinson and Adrian Smith back in. The album signaled a return to form after the band's less commercially successful 1990s period. It features a more progressive and layered sound compared to their earlier work, with longer, more complex songs. Reception was overwhelmingly positive. Critics and fans alike praised the album as a triumphant comeback, combining the energy of classic Maiden with a more mature, progressive approach. Best songs on the album for me are The Wicker Man, Ghost of the Navigator, Blood Brothers, Out of the Silent Planet, and the thin line between love and hate. Number 7 Seventh Studio Album, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, released on April 11, 1988 via EMI Records, produced by Martin Birch. It's a concept album based on folklore about a seventh son of a seventh son who possesses mystical powers. The album marked a significant evolution in the band's sound, incorporating synthesizers and more progressive elements. It features some of Steve Harris's most complex and ambitious songwriting to date. The whole album is great, but I will mention Moonchild, Infinite Dreams, Can I Play With Madness, The Evil That Men Do, and The Clairvoyant. Number 6 ninth studio album, Fear of the Dark, released on May 11, 1992, via EMI Records produced by Steve Harris and Martin Birch. It's the last album to feature Bruce Dickinson on vocals before his temporary departure from the band, and replaced by Blaze Bailey later on. The album shows a slight shift in sound, incorporating some more diverse elements while maintaining the band's core style. The title track, Fear of the Dark, became one of Maiden's most popular songs and a concert staple. Fear of the Dark is often seen as a transitional album, bridging Maiden's 80s heyday with the changes they would undergo in the 90s. Despite mixed initial reviews, it has remained a significant part of their catalog. My favorite tracks on the album are Be Quick or Be Dead, From Here to Eternity, Afraid to Shoot Strangers, Fear is the Key, Wasting Love, The Fugitive, and of course Fear of the Dark. Number 5, Power Slave. The fifth album released on September 3, 1984 via EMI Records, produced by Martin Birch. It is widely considered one of their greatest works. The album features a strong Egyptian theme, both musically and visually, as evident in the iconic cover art and the epic title track. Reception was overwhelmingly positive. Critics praised the band's musicianship, songwriting, and ambition. Power Slave is often cited as a definitive heavy metal album of the 1980s. It solidified Iron Maiden's status as one of the genre's leading bands and set the stage for their massive World Slavery Tour. This amazing album contains songs as Aces High, Two Minutes to Midnight, Flash of the Blade, Power Slave and Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Number 4, The Number of the Beast, third album released on March 22, 1982, via EMI Records, produced by Martin Birch. 
This album is often considered Iron Maiden's breakthrough, propelling them to international stardom. It features some of the band's most iconic songs, including the title track, The Number of the Beast, which is the one of Iron Maiden's anthem. Bruce Dickinson's powerful vocals brought a new dimension to the band's sound, perfectly complementing their musical style. The Number of the Beast marked a pivotal moment in Iron Maiden's career, defining their classic sound and establishing them as leaders in the new wave of British heavy metal. The whole album is amazing, but I will mention Children of the Dam, The Prisoner, The Number of the Beast, Run to the Hills, and Hallowed Be Thy Name. Number three, the debut album, Iron Maiden, released on April 14, 1980, via EMI Records produced by Will Malone. It features Paul Diano on vocals, providing a punkier edge compared to later albums. It contains several tracks that became early classics. Reception at the time was positive, especially in the UK, where it helped establish Iron Maiden as leaders in the new wave of British heavy metal. Critics praised the band's musicianship and the album's energy. While some fans prefer the more polished sound of later albums, Iron Maiden is widely regarded as a crucial debut, and it has some amazing tracks as Prowler, Remember Tomorrow, Running Free, Phantom of the Opera, Transylvania, Amazing Instrumental, and title track Iron Maiden. In one word, perfect. Number two, Somewhere in Time's sixth album released on September 29, 1986, via EMI Records produced by Martin Birch. The album is notable for its introduction of guitar synthesizers, giving it a more layered and futuristic sound. The cover art features a cyberpunk-inspired Eddie, reflecting the album's sci-fi themes. The production is crisp and polished, emphasizing the new guitar textures. Reception was generally positive, although some fans were initially unsure about the new elements. Somewhere in Time is often seen as a bridge between their earlier work and the more progressive direction they would take with Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. This great record has some amazing songs as Caught Somewhere in Time, Wasted Years, Heaven Can Wait, The Lone Lines of the Long Distance Runner, and Alexander the Great. Amazing record. And finally, my best. Number one, Peace of Mind, fourth studio album released on my third birthday, May 16, 1983 via EMI Records, produced by Martin Birch. It's the first album to feature Nico McBrain who replaced Clive Burr on drums, completing the classic Iron Maiden lineup. Reception was very positive, with many critics and fans considering it a step up from their previous work. The album is often regarded as one of Iron Maiden's strongest releases, as I think the same. Peace of Mind represents Iron Maiden at a creative peak, balancing technical prowess with memorable songwriting. I like all songs, but I will mention Where Eagles Dare, Revelations, Flight of Icarus, The Trooper, and Still Life. This record is a masterpiece. Leave your thoughts and your rankings in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more metal content and unboxing adventures.